Well, my name is Elizabeth Lee. I'm from Johns Hopkins University, and um, this session is about um, how GTFCC is trying to uh, develop guidance and um, think about prioritization of interventions in, in specific areas. So I am the subgroup lead uh, for what we nickname the hotspot subgroup, but really it's um, how we are prioritizing interventions in um, specific area. So that's what I'll be talking to you about today is a bit about um, the work we've been doing in the subgroup over the past year, year and a half. So the, uh, the priority areas for interventions or hotspot analysis, as many people might be familiar with, is one of the key uh, steps in, in the global roadmap. So uh, as part of trying to identify um, where intervention should be targeted in national cholera control planning. The um, identification of these priority areas is one of the key things that needs to occur as a first step. And so um, this is something that is uh, across multi-sectoral interventions. This isn't specific to just OCV campaigns or just WASH interventions, et cetera, but this is really meant to be a first step triage in identifying where those areas should be for further discussion within the country. And um, the, uh, one, of the key, one of the things that's uh, important for reliable hotspot identification is that it leads to, it's sort of critical for developing effective control and elimination strategies. And as many of you that have been around for a while remember, we actually had developed a version of this guidance in 2019, which was um, which went through all of the approval processes in September 2019. You can find this guidance on the GTFCC website. It's called Guidance and Tool for Countries to Identify Priority Areas for Intervention. And the primary features of this guidance were um, based on two, uh, two indicators. One is mean annual incidence, and the other is uh, what we call persistence, but it's the percentage of weeks with uh, any reported suspected cases over the entire period of study. And um, a few of the features of this were that the, the guidance focused a lot on these two indicators, but was quite flexible in terms of how countries determine what thresholds for each of these indicators would be, and then, um, and then locations that exceeded the thresholds in both dimensions would then be considered high priority areas for intervention. Um, and they, there were high, medium, and low prioritization groups that come from a result of this analysis. So you can see an example of this here. So you have the persistence indicator along the x-axis and mean annual incidence rate per 100,000 population along the y-axis. And so locations that are in that top right-hand corner box are considered high. Those in the two, uh, in the top left and bottom right would be medium, and those in the bottom left would be lower priority locations. And uh, this, this uh, guidance was used for the past two or three years, and several countries have actually um, gone through NCP development during that time, so we kind of got to see how it worked in reality, where some of the gaps and challenges were. And that's where this uh, subgroup was born, was we realized that there were some gaps and, and needs for update. So over the past um, year, and I guess we started this group in eight, 2020, maybe. 2021, I'm not sure what year it is anymore. So uh, we, we've done a number of different things. So the first was that we reviewed all of the previous hotspot identification exercises that had been done for cholera um, through GTFCC and through UNICEF. And um, the goal of, the, of this exercise was to identify gaps and challenges, and that could help us inform the development of this revised framework. So we uh, administered a standardized questionnaire to a number of different ministries of health and people that had been involved in the hotspot, in the prior, uh, prioritization process. And um, we extracted a few guiding principles and, and one of them obviously was simplicity, wanting to make sure that it was easy to communicate um, and also easy for countries to implement, uh, that it could be generalizable to different contexts, so not just um, meeting countries that had very endemic cholera transmission, but those also that were seeing sporadic 
cholera transmission or outbreak type uh, epidemiology. And as a related feature was that we wanted something that could be flexible and also accommodate some of the country context that always comes into this consensus building process. And uh, finally, uh, because this is something that informs NCP development, this is really about targeting long-term planning. This isn't just uh, you know, identifying places that are imminently trying to respond to an outbreak. So we've now, after performing the review and, and discussing with a number of different stakeholders, we've come up with a draft framework. Um, so the, the general principle, of course, is about thinking about how a country should identify priority areas for mid to long term planning of cholera interventions. And because we wanted to be flexible, we have two different tracks. One um, is where cholera transmission is relatively high or moderate. And for these countries, we would want to identify priority areas according to cholera impact in recent years. So uh, where cholera burden was recently seen. Whereas for another set of countries where cholera transmission is relatively low and perhaps they might be uh, trying to achieve elimination within this next round of NCP development, uh, there's a slightly different task at hand, which is trying to identify priority areas where there's a risk for reestablishment. So either risk of importation, risk of, um, of sporadic transmission. And so I'm gonna talk uh, briefly about these two tracks. This uh, one on the left for countries that have relatively high or ongoing tra uh, cholera transmission, uh, we, we are sort of expanding the existing framework that was there. So uh, we're keeping this idea of of incidence and persistence within um, within these locations, but because we wanted to realign some of the indicators to match what we say in the roadmap, we also wanted to include a dimension related to mortality. I think the roadmap goal is reducing 90% of cholera mortality um, by 2030, so neat, we, we wanted to include this dimension. And then of course, we also know that it's important to really consider laboratory confirmation, and we, we added this as a fourth dimension as well. And the, the principle is that we have these four different types of indicators that we can combine into an index and score each of the locations in these uh, in countries. So uh, one of the gaps that we had identified in our review was that there was a lack of guidance about how thresholds for each of these indicators should be identified. And so um, we, we will be adding some, some additional information about how the feasibility of targeting all of the high priority areas should be taken into consideration when determining the, the thresholds for each of these dimensions. And then of course, we, we want to try and be efficient in the way that we're targeting interventions. And so considering as well, feasibility of targeting so these locations, but also the prospective impact that having interventions in all of them uh, would reduce overall cholera burden. So going back to um, the other track where cholera transmission is relatively low, and maybe the, the country is aiming for elimination. Um, this is something that we're still, uh, we're still in discussions to as to how this would be implemented, but um, some of the key principles are that we would identify priority vulnerable areas. So one, of course, targeting places that still are reporting active transmission or still are reporting cases on a regular basis. And then, um, thinking more about risk factors um, for the reintroduction and spread of cholera. So for example, um, water and sanitation access, as well as lo um, location of, of particular IDPs or refugee camps, things that, um, that are potential risk factors for larger spread. So this would be a combination of qualitative risk factor assessment and as well as a WASH assessment. So since we've developed this overall framework, we've been in the process of piloting the new guidance with a few different countries. Um, one, 
I mean, the goals of this are, are obviously to figure out whether we've, we've thought of the different aspects that need to be considered. And we also wanted to hammer down which specific indicators would be used in each dimension of the index and then compare, compare the different performances of these indicators and make sure that we're getting to a set of data that we believe is going to be useful in, in reducing uh, cholera burden as well as um, possible to collect in, in a variety of different countries. So on the cholera impact side of the, of the guidance, we've been working with uh, DRC and we recently completed a pilot uh, within their country since their um, ongoing development of NCP is occurring right now. And Dr. Placide will be presenting a little bit more about that in his presentation after mine. And then we are also um, starting up a pilot within Mali on this uh, guidance related to the risk of reestablishment. And uh, just to give you a hint, there's, there was a lot of data analysis that went into coming up with these indicators, but the way that we actually came to a final proposal was thinking about a, a feasibility dimension along the x-axis and an impact dimension on the y-axis. So by feasibility, I mean number of districts or air de santé or whatever the, the zone level of analysis is, how many places would be targeted if all of the high, um, high priority loca locations were going to receive some sort of intervention? Um, because, you know, as you're increasing the number of air de santé, it's going to be a lot harder to have a feasible um, implementation in every single one of them. And then along the y-axis, um, we have a, a few different proxies for impact. So potential coverage of case burden, potential coverage of mortality burden, um, and persistence. So we, we tried to use this um, sort of basis of evidence to compare the different indicators as well as the different index measures that would be used. So the final step, I, I know this kind of skips over a lot of the details, but Dr. Placide will be presenting some of the more specific indicators. Um, but what we've been doing now, or what is sort of planned for the next few months, is to consolidate a draft revised framework. And uh, we, we do still need to, to do a little bit more piloting. So on the impact side, um, I think finding uh, figuring out how to incorporate laboratory confirmation data is still something that we need to do. And uh, we've also been considering piloting in countries with different kinds of transmission patterns in order to make sure that the, in the indicators will be uh, sufficient. And then thinking more about how missing spatial data or other types of missing data are dealt with in our framework and being very explicit about how that should be um, considered is something that we plan to include in the final guidance. And as I mentioned before, we're, we're still in the process of piloting with Mali, and I hope we'll have some more information about that in the next couple of months. So um, over the next year, our, our vague subgroup work plan is to finalize and consolidate this revised framework develop more specific technical guidance for countries, as well as develop a supporting tool. Um, the original 2019 guidance had an Excel spreadsheet that uh, countries were asked to fill out, and there was some automated formulas that presented graphs. Um, and I think we'll, we may have something similar, we may have something a little bit more, um, uh, more plug and play, but we'll, we'll see. And then we're also talking about developing training materials, such as videos as and um, additional worksheets to support countries that are uh, going through this process. And I'm just presenting this on behalf of a large subgroup that's been really active. And thanks to all of you that have been involved in this work. It's been a really great experience. And I'm happy to yeah, end the presentation here. Thank you so much.